I kind of refer to this whole uh, training evolution as big space, small space, really small space management. And we all went to the academies or learned, you know, the basic kind of way to pull hose. We take the hose out, put it down on the ground, pick a couple loops from the back and throw them back, right? And then it, hopefully it works out. I kind of refer to that as religious hose pulling because we're kind of just praying at that point that the throws are good. How many times have you grabbed the wrong loop and one goes back and then the other one leaves a whole bunch of slack or it hits you in the leg or winds up in a bush, you know, and you wind up running back and kind of having to fix all those little uh, mishaps, you know, that kind of come out sometimes. It works fine for this application and the downside is that we train in a big drill grounds, open parking lots, all these open spaces, but how Lakeland Village how much open space do you really get to deal with, right? Merino Valley, I got four cars in the front yard, three in the driveway, trash, you know, two bottles, everything. I get maybe a four foot diameter space on the front porch. So we kind of realized that we were really good at dealing with a very forgiving situation. But when it came to dropping in small drop points or even worse, elevated drop points like this, you know, stairwell or motel exterior walkways, um, it became a little bit harder and we had to configure the hose a little differently. So everything that I'll say over here, uh, first, none of it I created. It's all stuff that I've learned. So I'm not the brainchild of this. This is what people have taught me or I've learned from other places, you know, and kind of brought down to make work for me. This is the way that the world makes sense to me. It's not the only way to do anything by any means. Um, but I will promise you that everything that I say or do here, I do personally and has worked very well for me. Uh, and every little step I'll point out is because I made a mistake somewhere and I thought like, uh, how can I safeguard against that? So again, not to patronize you, but I'm gonna go through all the little minutia and those minute steps uh, of pulling the hose. So <clears throat> we're gonna do coils, which I use for small spaces. And about 90% of the time I use the coils uh, just cause I like it. It's clean, it's a nice footprint. It's real easy to manage the slack, but there are some points to it, you know, where it can go well or it can fail. And, Everything really just because we do this here once or see it, we got to do a lot of training really to perfect it to bring the product forward and have it perform the way that it's supposed to. So um, we'll do coils. I'll talk about how to move them and we'll lean them up on their side a little bit, you know, kind of show that really small footprint. Uh, but it all starts right back here. And as cliche as it is, um, the success of this whole thing starts with the hose load and back of the firehouse. And I'm a huge psychopath when it comes to hose and pulling hose but clean folds, clean hose. Um, and I even like to alternate my hose colors. You know, we have a bunch of different hose out there, but I like to get a bright yellow one and then I'll get a really dirty one, you know, or a whitish one. So it helps me identify those 50 foot breaks. And that comes in really handy for disaster management um, and a couple different things. If we go splitting piles or stuff like that, where I can see those, those changes in hose lengths so that I know where to grab or what goes where. And I'll talk about it a little bit later. So. Uh, hose cleanliness, and you're gonna notice I don't wear my gloves. I'm not gonna advocate that you do wear your gloves. We quit, uh, quit putting the rattlesnakes and the barbed wire and the broken glass and the hose loads, I think in the 70s. So um, if we do it right, it should be clean, dry, well manicured hose that's perfectly safe for me to grab. I need my dexterity, so I want my fingers, all right? So I come up here, first thing that I do, I'm not tall, I gotta get on the tailboard. Some of you are, are blessed with the gift of height, but I'm not. So I come up and instead of grabbing the bar, I actually grab the hose and as I come up, I pull out at the same time. And this is a really big step that initially I think messes things up, at least the way I do it. If I pull the hose out too far, then these start to kind of fall you know, apart. All I care about is the cleanliness of the front third of these folds of hose. I don't care what the back of it looks like. As long as I keep the front really clean, I can do endless amounts of uh, you know different operations with the hose. So I pull the hose out just enough to expose the male shank. I want that shank exposed and I'm gonna rest and put my right hand just behind that male shank. Not any further, not on the nozzle. And there aren't any couplings loaded right here. I really am conscientious when I'm loading the hose. If I gotta do a Dutchman or something, um, if the couplings aren't lining up right, I don't want them where my hand's gonna be so they you know, don't do that beach ball effect and wobble on each other. The, my worst case scenario is this pile spitting out of the middle and falling apart. So I say if you gotta do a Dutchman or do any length modifications, do it to the back, not to the front. Um, when I get this out, 
I'm gonna stretch this out up and over my shoulder so that it rests on my shoulder. And I have this kind of sandwich grip, sort of like this waiter tray carry on the bottom, and the top hand just mirrors it for a nice sandwich grip like that. Before I step off the tailgate or the tailboard, I go to what I affectionately refer to as the, the 80s boombox grip, right? Uh, this one I've had happen, I, I stepped off the tailboard with that sandwich grip. I hit the uh, four inch that was run under the tailboard, I rolled my ankle, and all the hose just spit out of the side right here at the back tailboard. So I started encircling the hose like this so that at least if I fell, I got a good handle on it and it's fully wrapped and encompassed by my whole body. So I step off, I feel that tug before I move, letting me know that I cleared the hose bed. And once I feel that tug, I know that I can turn and go in whatever direction I want to. But make sure that we clear the bed first. And then a big thing that I I see <clears throat> throw the hose loops before it tugs on you because I want my balance and I don't want this hose bundle to get fouled so I switch my hands kind of like this and I just wait with this one ready to throw so once I feel that tug I just throw and walk away from that hose so I walk in at my drop point just anticipating that tug <clears throat> and I throw the hose before it pulls on me <clears throat> So we'll go in this door and it's nice. We have the expansion joint right here, <clears throat> but lining up on center uh, for my drop point is pretty nice because I want to eliminate as many friction points as I can right off the bat. It's Cal Fire, right? We do more with less. So we don't have 50 guys in the front yard able to manage slack, you know, like LA City or something like that. So I try to set myself up to be as successful as possible in the beginning without any help. So really lining up on center line of that door is what I'm going for. So as I approach the door, I switch back to that sandwich grip and I'm really going to use the ground kind of as my partner to help me stretch this out. So from this sandwich grip high to low, I'm going to take one step here and the ground kind of catches the back of that hose and I lunge forward so that I set it down. So a big reason why I switch my grip, a lot of people, one, I don't want to drop it from my shoulder because it gets all messy. And then two, I don't want to drop it from my arm being wrapped around it because all that hose slides down my arm and tends to get uh, pulled apart or messed up. If I put it back into that sandwich grip and set it down, then my hands just come away and you can see that the bundle stays pristine right at the front. And that's what I care about. Because the order of these loops is gonna be really important. And that's one of the key points where this goes wrong for people or why they don't like the coils, because you gotta stress the importance of these getting loaded on your arm in the proper order. It's not a deal breaker, but it gets messy if you don't. So from there, <coughs> everything's clean. I'm 100% confident that these are all in the proper order, the sequential order that they were loaded, very important. I take the nozzle, I say isolate the nozzle. I set it over there to the side on the back side of me. Reason being, as long as I don't drop this coil pile on top of the nozzle and then have to figure out where does it go, if I don't pass that nozzle through a loop of hose, it's impossible to tie a knot, right? I might get a bite on something, but that's just an easy fix of me moving it out of the way. So if I drop this on the nozzle and then accidentally pull it through, I can tie the old fashioned you know, granny knot in this hose, which we don't wanna do. So I isolate the nozzle out of the way, and then I come back here, Minuteman for us is a right-handed pull, so it's gonna be my left hand, but if we're doing the flat load, load the arm that's closest to the fire door from the nozzle side. So I'm sitting on the nozzle side, I'm gonna load my left arm that's closest to the fire door. And when I put my arm through the loops, it goes down, you can see it naturally comes up onto my arm that way. I wanna load them all the same way. If I don't load them the same way just like that, Again, not a deal breaker, but it defeats the purpose of me doing the coils and trying to keep that small circle because the one that I do the wrong way or the other way will shoot out a big loop, like an eight foot loop. It basically just doesn't make a coil out of that one and it makes a really big coil. So it doesn't ruin the load, it just doesn't keep it in the small package that we're looking for. And if you look at the back, it's all twisted on top of each other. Don't even worry about it, not a big deal. I see a lot of people waste a lot of energy, go back there and try to fix that. It doesn't matter as long as all of this stuff up here is nice and clean. So I keep loading these up onto my arm, just like that. The same way in order, this right hand literally traces my forearm till these can clap, so there's no hose in between them. 
and I stand up and I open it up. Now this one, this area right here where my foot is, you can see a couple of those twists. That's the only area I've ever had any issues with twisting. And the way I deal with that, I just take this hose real quick and I just roll it forward, just a little bump like that. And you can see that shook them out right there. That got rid of my problems. So once I'm happy with all that and I'm where I wanna be, I step through my coils and I'm gonna use my heels to kind of drag me back to center line. So I drop this right on the center, hopefully. Spread my arms real wide. Spread my legs, my feet wide. Keep your feet planted. I wanna use the back of my calves to catch this hose so that when it goes out, it opens up in a nice circle. So I shoulder shrug and throw. I kind of call this, it's like the, the uh, Christmas story, you know, kid in the snowsuit, the stance, little Ralphie. Yeah, but see. Uh, it's a goofy stance. You stick your butt out, you spread real wide, shoulder shrug and throw forward. It's a nice little circle. So step out of the circle before you go messing with stuff. People a lot of times will be in the circle trying to fix things. You're in the middle of it spinning around in a circle. Step out, look at the whole thing, and I promise you it's only gonna be this corner. And if you're doing more than turning your wrist, you're doing too much. To fix any problem is literally that. With hose, it's finesse. It's anytime you're doing big, violent movements, you're doing something wrong. So just a little turn, we're good here. I just have to address my tail. So instead of running all the way back there, I look at it, I got a little kink right there, maybe a little one at the tailboard. It might work itself out, but if there are big problems, I just step on the hose right here, make sure that nobody's standing right back there you're gonna hit. Done, right? Step on my nozzle, tip my hat back, call for water, mask up, glove up, we're good to go, okay? So the benefit of the coils, one, it's a small footprint. You can see how much space that this really takes up. It's gonna load, you guys have all done this, right? Have you all done it? So you trust that the water loads, you know, in the proper sequence and it all comes out real nice and pretty. What I like about this better than just throwing all the, the hose flakes back is it's organized, it's small, I can easily manage slack, but it's dynamic. If this isn't the proper drop point, then all I have to do is sling this on my shoulder, pick up this pile, and we can go somewhere else. Same product. And this is the classic garage fire. I go to the front door and then I get the order, hey, we want to leave the man door between the garage and the kitchen intact so we don't mess up the house. Take that around to the man door on the side of the garage. All right, well, I can do that, no problem. I don't have to go pull another line or do any of this. I just grab this and take it around the side. So uh, it's flexible. I like that part of it. I'll drag it back over there in a sec. So the other format, if we're in a really small space, I just wouldn't throw it. I just put, I keep this on my arms right here. I pull it away from the wall about a foot. You see, I keep one foot inside, one outside. I leave it here on my arms, I promise you. As, as long as you're not taking a nap on it, you're not, you're not gonna get hit with it. Um, just hold your arms right there, hold your face back, and it'll load right around your arms and it'll stand up real nice along the wall right here. And it works great for like those stairwell applications, um, two and a half the bundles where we're doing exterior standpipe drops, those kinds of things. Uh, this is a great option. It takes very little space. It takes more management. You can see as the hose cycles back and forth, you know, it's gonna wanna roll and pull it on it and might wanna fall down. So it takes more attention on the backup person. Um, but sometimes it's your only option. So this is a really small space option. So coils, small space, coils leaning against the wall, really small space. But you see, I, I need about a foot of floor space and a wall. So it works great. All right, let me take this back over there. We'll put some water through it. Are you guys in the, do you guys tip your helmets back to mask up? Or do you take them off and put them on the ground? You take them off or take them off? You go back down. So. Just a side note. 
I was a down on the ground guy also until I went to the truck and then being up on the roof, um, when my helmet almost slid off the roof, I quickly realized, oh, I, I might want to keep that thing close. Um, so uh, just food for thought, try it. I see some people hanging on their arm, but tipping it back turned out to be a good habit for me. Okay, so you see you got pumped. It's cycling up nice. So if we do have kinks, instead of running back there to fix the kinks, we can do what's called cycling. And cycling is gonna use the hydraulics of the hose in order to work as a partner for me. And a lot of people get afraid like, oh, the water hammer, you know, but we're not gonna water hammer the pump. It's just a way for me to get some work done. So, if I need this, to blow out some kinks. You see how the hose moves? It pops those suckers out a lot of times for me. So I just cycle to get the hose to manipulate to bounce those out real quick. So going to door transitions, the first thing, I'm a huge advocate of moving with slack. I don't like going, I call it inch for inch, where I just take the nozzle and go wherever I go and I'm tethered to this hose. And every inch I move is an inch of slack, you know, or ground that I gain. I like to move with a force multiplier, if you can kind of think of it like that. So I like to move with slack, at least in the very beginning. So moving with slack, I take that first loop and flip it off. And you can see the second loop Right here, I just tuck that underneath my, my elbow right here. I can still manipulate the hose the same way with it tucked underneath, even if I'm down here. I can still be able to do all the same stuff. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna mule this in as far as I can. And once it gets hard to pull, just let go. But look at how much free movement I built into my initial pull. And if I do that, and my backup person does that, I promise you, you'll jam 100 feet into that house before you even break a sweat. And it's really nice, it works really well. But just remember, it, when it gets hard, just drop it. And then you should have another 10, 15 feet of free movement. Now you don't want to go loops any longer than this, because you can imagine if they're really long S's, half of it's still outside while I'm inside, and then nobody knows which one to pull on. So I'd say that this length is about as long as I want to go, and that's why I like to collapse my loops back down when I do S's. I don't like long S's. I like shorter ones. So I can take slack in because I don't want to leave it out in the front yard. I don't want to have to be inside, have to be outside. Does that make sense? All right, so door transitions. Can I get, Rob, you mind help me out? Can I get, so think of doors like cops and military guys are really good at door transitions because there could be a bad guy back there shooting at you, right? It, it's possibly life-threatening, dangerous. Well, same thing for us. We're talking about ventilation-limited fires, air introductions into fires. Um, now, it's not just a global, you know, rapid fire event, but you can have micro events. Under, you lift a mattress and you get a rush of air. You can have a micro, you know, burst of fire activity. We open a door to a room. <coughs> I can have a micro, you know, rapid fire activity. So when we transition doors, it should be methodical and cautious whenever possible, especially our first crack at it. So a big part is how do I set up? This is an outward swinging door. So on an outward swinging door, I'm gonna set up on the knob side. Reason being the door swings out and as soon as it cracks, I can see the very beginnings of that fire behavior. I can make something happen with my water and I give my guy who's helping me out the shielding of the door to protect himself. If it were an inward swinging door, I'd set up on the hinge side because most of the time, <coughs> in order to save square footage in the, in the building, an inward swinging door is gonna open to a wall probably. If not, it takes that whole arc out of the room that's wasted space. So if I set up on the knob, I'm probably looking at a wall and I'm gonna have to button hook around that molding jam to get a good access at the majority of the room. Where if I set up on the hinge, right off the bat, I see the crack of the door, but I also have 70, 80% of the room available to me to be able to manipulate my hose right from the threshold to get at most of it. Does that all make sense? Yeah? All right, so if Rob and I are gonna transition this door, 
I'll give him this side. I'm gonna set up kind of, you know, at a 45 on the knob. And we're gonna do this little down. So I'm gonna say, okay, open it. Now if it's if it's turbulent, smoky, fire blowing, whatever, close, close. So we give it a little bit of water, we close it. We can see if it's not good, we have the ability to shut it. If it's not good, I have the ability to put water in there, a little, little bit of steam work, and then we can check it out again, open. So it's either good or it's not good. I like it this time, so yeah, we're good. So he opens the door, and I'm gonna take this hose, go ahead, and I'm gonna pull as much of it with me as I possibly can. So you guys see what I got right here, and it get, it's getting kind of difficult for me. So I'm just gonna let that go. And then I can just go off and around. So did anybody help me out? I got all the way here all by myself. And I'm still talking to you, I'm not breathing very hard. I just slid across the ground. So uh, pretty nice to at least take that first movement with that slack with you, because it makes life so much easier. All right, same thing, door transition here. Um, so I guess if anything, you guys all know how to pull hose, um, but if you're not taking the slack with you, Give it a shot, you know, see if that system can work out. It really helps me out a lot. Uh, and then with the doors, just, the, it's, you know, think of them. That's possible danger. That's a drastic difference in environments that we're transitioning into. So, any questions? Cool. All right, we'll go do the dry bundles out there and work on it. Flat load's pretty similar to the Man and Man, other than the, nose con or the nozzle configuration is on top of the pile instead of the bottom. So it doesn't pay off on my shoulder the same way that it does with the Man and Man. There are a couple different steps that we need to do. Uh, I like to try to, same thing, alternate the hose whenever possible, especially on the flat load, because it's gonna be really helpful for me picking out where I need to pull my loop for my, uh, my slack to my initial drop point. If I know that my drop point is 50 feet away, then if I grab that 100 foot loop and walk to my drop point, then I should have a 50-50 um, stretch that goes out from here to the door. So we can kind of split things uh, just with the math of the pile and how far away our, our drop point is. So what I do for my most bread and butter is I'll grab where I think halfway down the pile is and if I have different hose colors, it, it's really easy to notify where that is with the difference in colors, but I'll grab half of it and just slide the pile out and keep the nozzle in control. Again, not being very tall, it's a little harder for some of us, but just slide it out nice and controlled, put it on my shoulder. Once I clear the actual hose bed, I'm gonna turn back into it to the side that I don't have the bundle on. So I'm gonna turn back this way and I'm gonna go underneath it and I'm looking for that halfway loop of this 100 feet that's left that's gonna give me my 50 feet to my drop point. So I grab that loop that's about in the middle there and I'm just gonna pull that straight out of the bed. And as I pull that, I walk straight to where I need to go. And if it's pre-plumbed, it's pre-plumbed, I'll feel the tug. If not, I need to know when to stop. So right there I stop, and you can see I'm pretty close to having 50 feet out onto the ground that takes me to my draw point in that one move. So no run backs, no going back to the engine. I got it all out in one movement. The next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna split piles, and we'll split piles and stretch backward because I already went to my drop point right here. So splitting piles is just like the name sounds. I'm gonna find roughly the middle of my pile and I'm gonna grab it with that same grip. My left hand's on top, my right hand's on the bottom and I'm gonna step and kind of spin out of it. So the right left hand goes up, the right hand stays down and I spin out. And if you can see, I spread my arms apart and I'm gonna kind of walk a little bit to stretch those straight again. I gently set it down, trying to keep everything nice and neat. 
and it's pretty identifiable. So three quick steps that get really fast with practice. One, I want to identify what comes from the fire engine from my initial line and that's pretty easy to see. I just follow the line and it's this one. I don't want to grab that one. I find the middle, which is the only one that's a V, this V right here. And for both sides of the pile, I know that that's my middle and that's my middle. So I don't want to grab those. And I know my nozzle's right here with its counterpart. So it leaves me a middle right here. And then I have two that are a middle right here. Doesn't matter, just pick one. And I'm gonna take these middles and walk back. So I walk back and this opens up. And I talked in the minute, man, about long S's as opposed to shorter S's. For the purpose of taking slack in with us, the shorter, more compact S's I think are more friendly. So I have to walk back that way anyways to get to my nozzle. I pick up these loops in my hand and I'm gonna kinda use my toe when I get right there to that third loop and I'm gonna collapse all of these down real quick just like this. So I've got my S's. Everything works out real nice when the water comes through. I stand on here, call for water the same way. When I'm ready to go into the door, I have my nozzle and here's my slack. Slack goes under the arm, nozzle, and we go forward just like we did before. So second variation of splitting piles is splitting piles and pulling forward. A little bit nicer, I think. It's more efficiency of movement. I don't have to go backward from my drop point and then walk back to it. But you have to equate for stopping short to pull forward an extra 20 or 30 feet. So if I pulled 50 feet out, which is pretty easy for me to do, um, just with the 200 feet of hose, it's easy math. Then if I have a longer drop point, if I bleed off some hose on the way there, I'd have to stop about 20 or 30 feet short in order to stretch forward the way that I'm gonna do it right here. The other, uh, the other downside though is that I can't collapse the piles back down without having to walk back to get them. So this one I think is nice for uh, those long, narrow configurations that you want, maybe on a freeway for car fires, uh, long hallway poles, those kinds of things where I think it works out really well. But it is nice because you keep moving forward. So same principles, we're gonna find the middle, roughly the middle of our hose bundle. Left hands on top, right hands on the bottom. And as I split them, I just lift up and I'm gonna turn out. And as I turn out, this, these extra couple little stutter steps are pretty important while I keep my, my arms out wide. That's what drags the pile out nice and open. And once you got it open, it's real easy for me to configure or orient this however I want it to look. And there's nothing wrong with giving it a little kick, but you can see that that pulling really stretches those out so that they're nice and straight and they're open so they're easy to deal with. I still have these all nice in my hand. I set them down nice and clean so that I have a good V right in front of me. Now, lots of options. I could just take this V and the nozzle and go forward. It'll be a giant S. I could take that V and go backward and it'll be a huge S. Uh, we already talked about splitting the middles, going backwards and collapsing down. So this one's just splitting the middles and going forward with a little bit smaller footprint than the big long S. So here's the one from the engine that I don't want. So I just mentally make a note, but for training purposes, I throw it to the side so that we know I don't want that one. This one I see comes from my V in the middle. I don't want that one either. So I'm left with these three. Well, the middle one's the middle. So there's my middle that I'm gonna grab. The same thing over here. There's my nozzle. I'm gonna take that with me, but I set it right over there to the side. So I don't want that. And here's my middle from my V. I don't want that. So I'm gonna take that middle the bale of the nozzle and that middle. So I collect those and we just walk straight forward. So it gives you a big open, long configuration. Good for side of the roads. Uh, it's all just the footprint that you needed to match, but stretching forward is real nice. It's real fast. Uh, it's real efficient in the movements. So just another tool for the toolbox.